Welcome to Building the Future. I'm your host, Kevin Horick. You can check out new episodes of the show every Tuesday and Thursday at 2 p.m. If you missed an episode or want to get more information about the show, please visit buildingthefutureshow.com. Welcome back to the show. Today we have Adam Spector. He's the co-founder and head of business at Lift Igniter. Adam, welcome to the show. Kevin, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, man, I'm I'm excited to have you on the show. I, I think what you're doing is actually really interesting and really cool. And I, like, it's been something that I think people have talked about if they're on, in the kind of tech community. But I think you guys are finally bringing this to kind of the average person's kind of company in sight and bringing it into kind of just like the average non-technical person's kind of day-to-day kind of online experience. But maybe before we get into that, let's get to know you a little bit better and start off with where you grew up. Yeah, absolutely. Um, So I I grew up in just outside of the Washington DC area um, and which was a fantastic life, great place to grow up and um, kind of fun to, to be around all the things that were happening, positive things that were happening in D.C. at the time. Sure. So were your parents kind of in politics or, or not really? <laughs> Actually, neither one was. My mom's okay. an artist. My dad's a lawyer. Okay. Um, so okay. neither one is. Okay. But it's D.C. It's sort of the town of politics. So you kind of, it's around. Yeah, fair. So you went to university, well, a few universities. What did you take in university and, and kind of give me the reason behind taking those in university? Yeah, so I went to Vanderbilt, um, which I absolutely loved. Okay. And at Vanderbilt, um, I did a, uh, I did, I I had two majors, actually. So I I dual majored in business, in political science. Okay. Which is, you know, doesn't lead to a lot of career stuff, but it's great sort of lead into what I did for my graduate degree, which is law, sort of a good law start. And once again, being the D.C., kind of person that I was, politics was interesting. Um, and I like to believe a, a force for good in many cases. Sure. Um, and then I also did something called HNOD, which stands for Human and Organizational Development, which is essentially um, how to be, you know, business, kind of business administration, leadership, um, group dynamics, uh, a lot of different sort of psychology. There were a variety of kind of things that were part of it, but super... I think super valuable for really anyone to learn um, in their career. Um, and I certainly loved that course. And that, that actually, the last part, I had a minor in philosophy as well. Oh, so interesting. Was, uh, lots of things there. Sure. Yeah. No, that that's great, man. And then you also went to the University of Miami for, for business and law? Yep, I did. Yeah, I got my JD MBA down in South Florida. Um, also, uh, you know, fantastic, interesting, totally diverse group of people. Um, down there and, and learned a ton um, and then actually took the bar in Maryland and I'm actually a, a barred attorney in the great state of Maryland still to this day. Okay, very cool. So what what made you go to Miami for current business and law? Um, a few reasons. Uh, first and foremost, um, I got a little money offered to me. That was okay. one. Um, another one is that um, my parents and grandparents and especially my grandparents uh, live about an hour north near Fort Lauderdale. Okay. Um, and at the time, they were getting old. And I'm lucky enough to say that my grandfather is still with us. He's actually turning 100 this year. Wow. Um, That's incredible. So he's even older than he was. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, lucky, which is all, all, super lucky for me, obviously, to still have him around. Um, but I wanted to be close to them. You know, sure. you know, family is a wonderful thing. And especially with grandparents, you only get so much time together. So I thought being in, in South Florida near them would be some special and for four years it really was. No, that that's great, man. So walk me through your you're done your education. Walk me through kind of your career history, because you've done quite a lot of things in in well, since you've graduated university. Yeah. Um it's it's been a busy time. <laughs> um so yeah, when I first graduated I took the bar. Um, that summer right after graduation. Um, and then I worked at a cool company called New Star, which was um, a uh, kind of telecom services provider. Uh, worked in the corporate development and sort of strategy group there, um, doing a ton of great stuff in, in kind of just the telecom space in general, which was just interesting and pretty dynamic um, and just great to learn. 
Sure. Um, in, in Corp Dev and strategy was sort of a, a great combo of a bunch of things I'd done in the past. So it was just exciting, mm-hmm. tech-related, which I liked. Um, but then I realized, I actually, another thing I did there, which is also I think really important, was I, I helped found their um, corporate social responsibility group. So I uh, started out what they were doing for how do we, how do we address environmental degradation related to the telecom space sure. um, and work towards having a policy around how do we, how do we treat our community, our environment better, um, while also being really positive and better for business. So um, a lot of cool things and enjoyable time there. Um, but, you know, like, like a lot of people, my generation, and a lot of people today still, um, I had an itch to do a lot of tech and really get into tech stuff. Um, and, you know, I, I remember speaking with someone who I got introduced to who worked at a tech startup in the D.C. area, and he actually told me something that I've never forgotten, which was he said, if you want to be in politics, um, be in the D.C. area. If you want to be in finance, go to New York. If you want to be in entertainment, go to L.A. And he's like, and if you want to do tech, you need to go to the Bay Area, San Francisco sure. Bay Area. Sure. Um, and for me, that was sort of a catalyst. And I said, okay, I should start seeing what's out there. Um, and I was lucky enough then to be recruited to come work at a company called Clearwell Systems, um, out in Mountain View, California, they were an awesome e-discovery company led by some fantastic leaders. Um, came out there, did e-discovery with them, um, part of the business development group, so like a lot of partnerships and sales. Um, mm-hmm. Also a great kind of use of my education, like JD and MBA, because I understood the legal side, so I understood how lawyers work, and, and also the kind of the, the MBA side um, and business. Uh, short version of that, we got sold for $400 million to wow. Semantic. That's um, awesome. So exciting exit. Yeah, and it was awesome. It was great. It was it's sort of what, what you moved to Silicon Valley for is to work in really cool things and maybe make some extra money on top of it. <laughs> Very much so, right? Living the dream. Yeah. So, um, of course, you know, there, there, there are always trade-offs, but yeah, I know it's fantastic. It's exactly why I wanted to get out here, and it was a great first taste of what Silicon Valley can offer um, and how you can really create something from scratch and have it be worth a lot of a significant amount of money um, truly thereafter because you're creating real value for, for your customers, for the community and everything else. So it's a, it can be a real win and it really was. So, um, that was that, uh, then I started my own company. Um, we did identity verification stuff to kind of say, Hey, how do we leverage your social networks and value, um, to your own benefit to help you kind of validate who you are, almost like a, a new form of a FICO credit score. Okay. Um, the company, it is a cool idea. I still think it's, it's actually one we're seeing a lot of use in today. Just I see it around, not what I'm currently doing, but sure. a lot of people are using that idea in different ways, um, alternative banking and things like that. Uh, the company itself, we ended up shutting it down, um, raised money to, from investors, returned a pretty good amount of money to investors. Not, positive, not, not more money, but they got a lot of their original investment back. Right. Um, and we, we shut it down. And uh lessons learned there was pretty simple, which was, you know, move fast and find a market. And I, I guess the one thing I will say is we actually, the, the one bit of advice I would have from that is um, if you find a, a product that you have that people are buying, paying you hard cash for, mm-hmm. to provide that service, follow, follow the money. That was my big lesson from that. Um, in, in, what we were doing there, we actually is sort of an, a corollary to our core technology product. We started doing um, background checks, basically, as a service. Okay. Um, and had a bunch of customers who signed up to do that. Um, and we were making real money doing it. And our core product was not making money. It was sexier from a tech perspective, but we weren't making money doing it. Got you. Um, Interesting. Yeah. And yeah, and so, I mean, the, the short version of that is we end up uh, – we didn't follow the money. We said we wanted to stick with our core, our core sexy tech product and ignore the money piece. And so the company ended up shutting down. It didn't work out. And then basically a year later, um, a bunch of other cool companies came out that were kind of doing the same thing. And um, one of them being Checker, uh, which is a background check company, which I'm actually an investor in. Okay. Um, and they came out and they completely crushed it and more power to them. They, they followed the money. They built a really good service. We, we easily could have been there far before that, um, but we didn't do that. So Interesting. Yeah, but I, but I think that's really good advice for people listening, right? Like, 
it, it sounds kind of probably like now looking back, you're probably like, oh yeah, like we should have done that. But like when you're kind of in it too and you're passionate about something, if you're not passionate about it, it's hard. It can be hard. And I get why you made that call, right? But it's it's a good yeah. thing to really consider and, and tell people. And I, and, I, and I love that. So you kind of mentioned um, a bit of being an investor. How long have you been been doing investment or investing sorry yeah so um you know had the the luck of being you know getting introduced to really cool companies Mm -hmm. and um kind of been doing investing really not a lot of my own money but um some some other people sort of wealthy wealthier individuals who want alternative investments got you um and don't don't have the connections in silicon valley and you know not that i have amazing connections by any means, but um, I do hear cool deals here and there. And when the opportunity arises, have an opportunity to invest. Got you. No, that's, that's really cool. So what exactly are you working on now? And why did you decide to co-found uh, Lift Lighter? Igniter, sorry. Yeah, no, not a problem. Um, so yeah, I mean, you know, part of what really got this started, I really have to give credit to my co-founder, Okay. Um, Andrew Neal. How um, did you meet he, him? Sorry, I don't want. I don't mean to interrupt, yeah. but I'm always fascinated by no, how somebody all. met their co-founder. Yeah, no, of course. And, and feel free to interrupt. I, I probably get too excited about things and go a little bit too long. <laughs> it's good, man. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, so, so we actually met through um, the investors in Lift Igniter. So as people oh, were investing okay. in Lift Igniter, um, right at the very early stages. Andrew Neal kind of reached out and said, hey, I, I really think I need someone on the business side um, who can help, you know, do a lot of business things, you know, sure. shore, shore up my weaknesses um, where he, he kind of knew what his strengths were um, in, in weaknesses and vice versa, right? So how do, I, how do I get someone who can help me, you know, be great on the business side? Sure. Well, I even um, having your legal background is like immensely useful. <laughs> like, you're totally right. Thankfully, I feel like I'm finally getting good use my all those years of, of law school. So yes, I, I agree. <laughs> it's like you don't. I don't think like we're like I've worked on at startups and we're I'm working on a startup now too. Like and it's funny because you do not realize how important having like a good accountant and good legal is until you like have been through it a few times. But like because you kind of think, well, we're just oh, yeah. gonna build this thing. We're gonna launch it and then. Like if it takes off and you don't have that stuff in place or have somebody that has any clue, because like I, I have like a design background, so I've never been to law school or accounting and like the, the classes that I took that had to do with numbers or any of that stuff, I just was like, boring, mm-hmm. never will need this. And now I'm like, oh, I could should have paid better attention there. So I think that's great that you have kind of a business background and a legal background. I think like that's a huge asset to any startup. They, yeah, no, I, I thank you for that. And I, I actually totally agree. I mean, I think having that background is great. I mean, you can build it up, obviously. I mean, you can learn all the same things, things that I learned in business school and law school just by doing it. Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot of people do. Um, but obviously having a little bit more of a form, some formal training is definitely really helpful. Um, it really saves the company some time and money because, of course, lawyers are extremely expensive. So if I can do at least some of that work on our own, my own, um, it, it saves us some money and we probably can move a little bit faster and be more nimble as well. Sure. So what exactly is Lift Igniter? Yeah, so we are a machine learning personalization company. Okay. Um, what does that and, mean for people that, that really don't mean, know yeah. what machine learning is? Because I, I think like to maybe especially non-technical people might not have heard of that. And even probably some technical mm-hmm. people. Totally. Totally. Yeah, no, it's definitely a term that is becoming more and more prevalent and people are starting to hear about it, but don't really understand it yet. Sure. And, and really what that means in our case, right, machine learning personalization is the ability to predict in real time for every single user, but not just user, for every impression. So literally every second and every action you take online, predict your likely next outcome, like the next thing you're going to click on or next thing you want to watch or next thing you might want to buy. Sure. Um, and it's actually really to provide a far better, richer, and more valuable experience to the end user. Um, so that it, we like to think of a pretty positive thing for everybody. It essentially saves you time finding and discovering what you want. Um, but 
before we kind of dig into that more, you know, the bigger question is probably when you're asking is around like machine learning. Yeah, yeah right? totally. So I guess and, like, how does that, yeah. like, how do you use machine learning in the platform and like, and to provide kind of content for people like on the fly? Because it, it's, I think to a lot of people, it's kind of like this crazy science experiment type thing, but it's actually like really, really cool. And like, I, I wish people like when I was kind of just earlier today, I like rewatched the video on your guys' homepage. And I must say like that, whoever did that, or like, I'm sure you were involved in it, but like you guys like <laughs> was, nailed yeah. it, like nailed it. How yeah. you guys like, I, like yeah. explain that, like people should just go and like, you know, go, go watch your like quick little video on your homepage. Cause like you nailed it. If you're like a startup, like go watch that or, or you want to learn more about your startup, but like, it's, it's like perfect. Exactly what it should be. Well, thank, thank you so much. I, I, I wrote the whole script for that. I mean, That's I, awesome. I can't get credit for the design. That was, we, we hired an outsourced firm to do that. Sure. Um, but yeah, I wrote the whole script and in, in what I even drew out in my terrible chicken scratch, what I theoretically wanted each slide sort of, each segment to look like and stuff like that. So um, I'm glad I'm glad it describes things well. Yeah. Okay. So for people that don't know, what, what exactly is it? Yeah. I keep and I'll stop interrupting yeah, so, you after this. <laughs> oh no no I said no problem at all. It's good for the flow probably. Um, but so you know machine learning right at the high level, it's exactly what it sounds like. It is a machine that is learning, um, learning on on any given application. Um, and what that means, essentially, the machine can become dynamic and intelligent and change in real time. So, so the way I like to describe kind of machine learning, and it really applies at least to the work that we do for our customers, is imagine, Kevin, the conversation you and I are having right now, sure. right? Um, you're, you're asking questions. I'm responding with answers. Um, and, so, and then my answers change your next questions and so on and so forth, right? That is a fully dynamic, hopefully intelligent conversation that we're having sure um however i i would completely fail if there were five kevins all on the phone right now asking me different questions i i couldn't scale to do that i couldn't answer all five of you at once sure um but even even if it was just one-on-one -on -one, you know digital properties today give every single user essentially the same static response right if you click on you know news article a they will always respond and give you news article B, even if you're someone totally different. Sure. Um, except that's not a dynamic conversation, right? So what we do is we essentially, we've created this technology that enables like the machine that's running in the backgrounds of our cu customer's website to learn from all of the users on that site and then provide to those, each individual user a dynamic conversational interaction where it's responding, the machine in the website essentially, or the app, is responding to every click, every action, um, everything you do to give you an intelligent response. And then how you interact with that response, just like our conversation, changes the next answer in a sense you get from the website. Um, and the machine will learn from your actions how to tailor the response to you. Um, it improves the model for everybody else also on the site, just like I, I've given answers like this before, so I've improved my answers and I've learned from previous discussions. Sure. I can give you a better answer today. Um, and that's essentially what, what machine learning does, is it learns from all users, it self-improves itself, and can change dynamically as your website or your users are changing. Yeah, no, I think that, that makes sense. And just for people that don't know, like they don't, you don't really notice anything different on a site. you just like, wow, this site's so tailored to me. Like I don't, like, how do they know everything kind of that I want to read next or view next or see next? Like, you just, it, it doesn't really matter, right? Like, that's the, what, how you, you I see it, exactly. it, right? Like, it, it's pretty cool. That yeah. Keep going. Well, and yeah, yeah. And the thing is, right, like, this is the thing that people don't realize is machine learning is already happening, right? Machine learning and AI, artificial intelligence, kind of term together a lot of times. And they're, they're similar but different disciplines. Um, but... But machine learning is happening nonstop all the time, and users don't even know it's happening. Just yeah. like they don't really know what's happening on our customers' websites either. Um, but you know, this technology was essentially first developed um, at Google. My co-founder was actually one of the five core people that helped originally build 
the personalization engine really? um, at Google. That's yeah. cool. Um, it was, and it, and it dramatically changed the amount of time people spent. They, they dramatically improved the metrics of how much time people spent watching YouTube videos is where they first launched this. Oh, sure. Of um, course. Makes sense. Yeah. And, you know, because it makes sense, right? If, if they can do a better, more accurate recommendation of a video, you'll spend more time on YouTube, yeah. which is good for the user because they want to find entertaining videos to watch. That's a win for the user. Yep. Now, it's also a win, of course, for Google because they make more money if you spend more time on the site. But everyone wins. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's happening on Google all over the place, machine learning. Um, Facebook, your entire Facebook news feed is machine learned. Totally. There's, you know, machine learning behind it to decide what videos, what articles, what ads to show you next. Um, and they obviously do a pretty good job making it engaging because people spend a lot of time on Facebook. Sure, totally. Um, so, so, so it's really... Oh, it's go ahead, keep everywhere. going. Yeah, no, that, that's all, that's it. Okay. Yeah. So you guys kind of have, well, the, the, you probably have a better term for it, but kind of like three verticals. Like you'll put content on kind of like a site and then you do an app side and then e-commerce. So let's start with kind of just like a, a, a somebody's website and they, they just want some content. Like how do they go about using Lyft Igniter? Yeah, so it's actually pretty straightforward, um, at least we think. Um, literally, you, you add a JavaScript beacon to the site. Okay. We start collecting data on the site, um, and we build our models based on your content, so the articles, videos, or items to buy, let's say, that you have. Mm -hmm. um, and then we also learn from your users. And so we gather the data about what your users are doing and how the users understand connections um, between different pieces of content. Okay, so um, do I, do I between to, those two data pieces, oh, ahead, we, we build our model. So. Okay. Yeah, that's it. So do I have to put my content into your service, or how does that kind of like work to serve up the different things based on who the user is? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, so you don't have to do anything extra beyond the JavaScript beacon. We do all the other work, which makes okay. it really easy for our customers to get started. Um, and our system automatically identifies who each user is. And remember, we actually don't have any PII, personally identifiable information about the user, okay. um, which makes it very, you know, so we can do this globally um, because we're not, we don't run a file of privacy rules, um, or at least right. we try very hard not to, and hopefully we, we are not. Um, but, but because we can use, we use what we would call very sparse data signals, okay. kind of a machine learning term, sparse data signal about each impression in, in the real ability and strength of our system is the ability to make a prediction in what we would call real time. Sure. So essentially the moment a user takes an action, we process that action, it's gone through our algorithms, and we've returned back a response to the site. So essentially we're taking contextual information about what the user is interested in in this moment in time um, and then giving a response which is super, if you can do that really fast, you can also be extremely accurate and, and learn from those users right when it's most important and they're most likely to take valuable actions for themselves and for the site. Sure, no, I, I think that, that makes a lot of sense and that's, that's really cool. Um, so how does the app side kind of work? Um, yeah, so app side is actually almost identical. Okay. Um, at least on the, the technology side, right? The data collection, we do a server side integration. Okay. So, um, cause, you know, there's, we can't collect data with a JavaScript beacon. Right. So we do a server side um, data collection. Got you. Okay. And then is e commerce different or how does e commerce work? You know, it's funny. We actually don't view e commerce as particularly different from media or enterprise B2B or anybody else. And here's why um, e commerce has lots of users. Okay. They have lots of items, right? Items for sale versus, let's say, an article or a video. And each user needs to be matched up with the perfect product they want to buy. Sure. And that's it. That's, that's literally all it takes, right? They need to be matched up accurately with the right item to buy. So from our algorithm perspective, there is no difference between media or e-commerce. Um, it's just we're, we're a matching engine that's extremely targeted in real time to each impression. Got you. No, that that's that's actually really interesting. So how does so I, I'm I, I stick this thing on uh, this like JavaScript on my site or or one of the other things, mm -hmm. and you guys start 
you know, sending different content to the different people that come to my site. How do you know, like, what do you start kind of gathering about me? Like, if I've never been to one of your sites that has isn't running the JavaScript file, because I'm assuming that if I go to, you know, this site and then that site and they're all running – you know, your, your JavaScript, you could start learning about me on other people's sites to know what to serve me when I go to another property that's running your service, correct? So actually, we don't quite work that way. Okay. Um, so we very much, we, we actually um, silo our data today. So when you go to site A, we're okay. going to do personalization and recommendations for you on site A, irregardless if we've seen you on site B, C, or D. Right? We, we, in a sense don't track across those right okay now. and is is there like what was the what's the reasoning behind that is that something you're going to add in the future or you're just like no 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 we don't want to do it like that because it doesn't make sense um it, it's possible but truthfully we don't need to right now um okay. the, the simple answer is we're getting 80 to 100 percent improvement in click-through rate engagement conversion metrics like that for our customers without having to merge data Interesting. across these wow. sites. Wow, that's incredibly yes, high. We, we, it is. Thank you. We crush it. We've never, we've never lost an A-B test against anybody. Yeah, so, that's, um, wow. Huh. Pretty cool tech. Yeah, of co- yeah, we'll see. yeah, okay. So are you pulling data from any other kind of like my social stuff or any other kind of sites like shopping or, or, or anywhere else? Or is it still just kind of very much just your vertical? Or my site, sorry. It, it's very much just on that site. Okay. Yes, we're not pulling data from any third-party sites or anything else. It's literally, what are you doing on that site at that moment in time? Um, okay, interesting. In, yeah, it, people wouldn't recognize that as being really powerful, but it actually is extremely powerful. As Once again, as long as you're using the data in the right ways. Right, um, okay. The fact that you, know, you liked Coca-Cola on Facebook doesn't actually have a lot of predictive power for the fact that you're going to want to buy that T-shirt on this other t-shirt site or something. Uh, yeah, okay, that's interesting. No, that, that makes some sense. But like you could potentially sell me other Coca-Cola down the road or like tomorrow or, or not really? Well, you could, but here's the thing, right? It just, you know, yeah, we know you maybe have an affinity to Coca-Cola, but that doesn't actually mean you want to buy Coca-Cola today. Okay, What's sure. far more important is, you know, what are you looking to buy right now, right? You're you're, you're in Canada, it's cold. You're probably looking to buy, you know, a winter coat, let's say, today. However, sure. maybe you then go on a website, um, a travel site, let's say, and you're looking for vacation to the Caribbean, right? Because you want to go somewhere warm. Um, you know, now, instead of looking at what you past you used to like previously or your past purchase history, we'd be far smarter if we said, hey, hey Kevin, you should go look for this pair of shorts or this great new bathing suit uh-huh. because... You know, right now, you're really interested in that warm weather. Got um, you. Who yeah. cares what you did previously? Sure. That you looked by a coat earlier today. Now you're looking for something warm. So let's, let's respond in real time to who you are at that moment. Yeah, okay. That makes total sense, right? Because you're right. You're, if I'm looking for a vacation, especially if it's in the future, you don't care about the past. Yeah, that's interesting. So kind of yes. for people that don't understand, how do, how do you guys even kind of do that? Yeah, so it, it's a super kind of detailed ensemble of a variety of different machine learning algorithms. Okay. Um, almost all of which we've homegrown here, but of course we're, we're built like, frankly, everything else in the world. We, we've grown on the, the backs of giants who publish a lot of fantastic machine learning research um, and who paved the way. Um, just frankly, I was getting like every, every single discipline in the world, I think, is that way. Um, and you got to give some props to um, everyone else who's, who's come before. But, uh, but we've really built a lot of our own algorithms internally. Um, and then really only in the past two years or so, two to three years, have you been able to marry really powerful machine learning algorithms that, you know, if, if you were to try to run these algorithms on your home laptop, even a good one, it would probably take days to run. Sure. We can run all of this now in the cloud on incredibly power, powerful servers at a relatively speaking low cost, and we can do that in milliseconds um, and serve the results. So essentially, it's a marriage of fantastic machine learning algorithms um, in extremely fast and scalable infrastructure. And when you merge those two together, 
you actually have a real-time machine learning system. Okay, interesting. So how does it work? Like, okay, so I, I've been running, say I, I, it's been like a couple months or a quarter, you know, I'm, I'm, you're obviously sent, changing the content based on who I am on a site. Do you guys provide like kind of stats or like, do I have like kind of a dashboard when I, when I log in or, or kind of walk me through what, what do I kind of, can I tangibly see that you guys have kind of done for me? Yeah, so um, we, we do have a dashboard, um, and you can absolutely track those 80-plus percent improvements we're getting you. Okay. Um, we actually make it easy, though, if people don't want to necessarily believe our stats. You can also use Google Analytics or other third-party kind of analytics tools okay. to see how well we're doing. Um, and we run these A-B tests, and we prove it out really clearly for you right at the beginning. Like, look, within, let's say it takes two to three hours, to install list Defender, and that's it. You're fully integrated in two to three hours. Okay. Um, within two to three weeks, you're going to be seeing on average 80 plus percent improvement in your metrics. Mm-hmm. Um, and so very, very quickly, uh, it should be hopefully very clear that we're, we're doing our job. Um, you know, don't believe me because like I'm telling a good story. We tell our customers believe the numbers. We are a math and machine learning company. And we love, we, we want our customers to believe the quantified metric outcome. Yeah, it's like data doesn't um, lie, right? Thing to... Data doesn't lie, exactly right. So, yeah, no, that's, that's really interesting. So what's the cost for people um, to actually use the service? Yeah, so it, it totally varies okay. based on the size of the site. So how much traffic you have, um, how many SKUs or items you have on the site. Um, it definitely it varies a decent amount, but you know it, it's in the few thousand dollars per month range. Sure. Um, let's say we're really averaging it out. Sure. So it's not cheap, um, but at the same time, we believe every single one of our customers has an extremely clear ROI. Sure. Well, and you guys already have some like really big names using your service, right? So, you know, when like I, I don't know if you can me- if you want to mention any of them, um, but. Like just even just right on your homepage, you have a bunch of like huge names that everybody's heard of, right? So it's obviously working, yeah. right? And so um, because those companies could pick whoever they want to use, right? At the end of the day, like, and if it wasn't working, they wouldn't be using you guys. Like, so it's, and if your success rate is is that high, which is like totally fascinating to me. So I want to dive a bit deeper into kind of just... For, for my own interest is like, how do you kind of know, like you kind of mentioned it a little bit, like I search for, uh, you know, like a beach vacation and you start recommending me shorts, but like what kind of other things do you kind of start suggesting to me or, or kind of, you know, prompt me with? So it, it really depends on the customer, right? If okay. you're a news site, we're going to be suggesting articles like sports articles or political articles. Um, if you're an e-commerce site with ha- which has a lot of t-shirts, we'll recommend other t-shirts. Sure. Um, it, it really, really varies and depends. Okay. But I mean, it can, I could add, I mean, it can be anything from articles to videos to music to images to items to buy. Um, you name it. Our view is that every single potential place you can make a recommendation, which is truly almost everything that you see, online. Um, Everything is a recommendation. That recommendation should be optimized using machine learning. And here, here's sort of, I think, the kicker, at least we, we truly believe this, which is if you are not using machine learning in personalization on your digital property in the next five years, you essentially will cease to exist as a business. Interesting. Um, you will not be able to compete. You, you just won't be able to compete because Google, Facebook, Amazon, all the big guys are already doing it. So you're already losing ground to them. Um, in the next five years, everybody else will hopefully be using Lift Igniter, um, but they'll be using something in this space because the results are too dramatic to ignore. And you, you, your users simply just won't come to your site or they won't buy a lot because they know they'll find it somewhere else. So No, that, that makes a lot of sense. So how do you guys deal with something like Google Home or Amazon Echo, not is it Echo Alexa? 
Uh, well, sense. I think Echo is the official product name. I think that, that Alexa is sort of the, the moniker, but I think yeah. Echo is the official product. Yeah, yeah. So, like, how do you guys deal with kind of those voice-activated stuff, or can you? Great question. Um, the short answer is we can. We don't do a lot of that today. Okay. Um, actually, we don't do any of that. Sorry. We don't, we don't, we don't do any of that today. Sure. Um, mostly because it's still really early. In a lot of cases, and most of those systems are fairly closed. I mean, Alexa has lots of skills mm-hmm. and things like that. Um, and I think longer term, we'll probably start working with the, the people who are creating the skills to, you know, it's actually really critical in places like um, voice activation or things like that to have really intelligent recommendations. Mm-hmm. because, um, you know, it, those are situations where it's really difficult to, you, you can't navigate things very well. So the quality of what the system is automatically recommending to you is even more important sure. and more critical to, to the system for it to be valuable. It has to make an intelligent recommendation right off the bat. And I'll give you, I'll give you one quick example. This sure. is another example of why this is so important for people. How I'll ask you, Kevin, a question, Kevin. Sure. How often do you go to page two of Google search results? Never. Like, like so, maybe once a year. Maybe, right? Maybe. Yep. You got it. So you have now just proved why um, really good recommendations are so critical, right? Sure. One, you never even have to go to page two. Two, you always go to Google. You probably don't go to Bing very often. No. Um, despite Microsoft building a great product. Mm-hmm. Um, you, you've been trained that Google is the place to go to get your answers, and you know you'll get it immediately. Totally. Imagine if every single site has the same ability. Sure. Interesting. Yeah. Well, to your point, like we're going to be there in the next three to five years, right? Easily. Easily. Well, we're, we're already there, right? Google, sure. Amazon, and Facebook already sure. have a lot of our traffic. So we're, we're already there, and it's just everybody else who needs to, to start doing this or face extinction. Yeah, fair enough. No, that that's that's really interesting because you're right. Like even on just like a- Android or iOS or just any of the Google products, like they're constantly recommending stuff based on you know like in some ways like a lot of people think it's convenience, but it's convenience is basically like machine learning, correct? Yep. That well, it, it, that's one form of machine. There's lots of forms. Sure. Yeah, convenience in our world, convenience is about intelligent intelligent recommendation sure which is which have to come from machine learning to do it at scale got you no that that makes a lot of sense so you kind of touched on this a little bit earlier um but i'm kind of curious did you guys kind of originally self-fund the first version you, you mentioned you took some investors or that's how you guys got mm-hmm. introduced you and your co-founder so like you took some investment at some point but like Walk me through kind of the early days. Did you guys self-fund this? Did you just get investment right away? Or how did that kind of come to be to build version one of, one of this? Yeah, no, we were, we were, you know, pretty lucky, especially with kind of the backgrounds that we have and really Interneal's background as an expert in this space. Sure. Um, he has a PhD in machine learning from Princeton and, and went to the, the, you know, spoke at the number one um, machine learning conference in the world and a bunch of other things. And, um, we got into what's the fairly well-known program, Y Combinator, right. that you've probably heard of. Yeah. Um, we got into Y Combinator, um, and very quickly thereafter, there were a large number of investors who were interested in in putting money into the company and, and helping us achieve our, our next level of goals. Sure. No, that, that makes a lot of sense. So I'm, I'm curious to know, what's kind of your typical kind of day look like working at like lift igniter like are you kind of on the phone a lot so are you t- email are you kind of building some stuff like what are you kind of what's a typical day i'm just just curious yeah no it's a, it's a great question um the, the first answer is it's actually really um it's changed over time okay as one would expect especially when you're a founder sure. um you know you kind of do everything so yep. some days it's sales some days it's marketing some days it's legal i um, mean it varies and as we've grown um, and have more and more customers, and frankly, more and more people interested in what we do. My role from a day to day perspective, I mean, I would say now I'm, I'm on the phone at least half the day. Okay. Um, I think today I've talked to three different potential customers already, and it's you know only um, we started talking at one o'clock today, so three different customer calls already today. Um, I I sent out one contract, actually two contracts today, as well, um, and had to modify those to make sure we had the specific things the customer wanted in there. Um, 
you know, now having this sort of discussion with you, sure. which I would bucket more on the marketing side of things, right? Sure. Um, and then have another custom customer site visit later today. So a lot of customer stuff. Um, but, you know, it really like I have emails about accounting things in my email account right now that I need to handle. Um, we're doing a really big partnership that's going to be announced in the next two weeks sure. that um, we're kind of trying to get the, the T's crossed and the I's dotted on that. So it totally varies. But the truth is, in the end, what it comes down to is just it's a lot. It's exciting. Um, I wake up energized every day, but there are it's a lot. I mean, I, I usually run calls um, or doing work from 8 a.m. till about 8 p.m. Sure. Um, every single day, five days a week, and then I'm usually working for at least one full day in the weekend. So it's six, at least six days a week for about 12 hours every day. Sure. Wow. A lot. That, that's a lot. But it, but when you're in love with it, it, it doesn't really feel like work. So I, I get that. And I'm always kind of curious to know, you know, like obviously, like we covered your background earlier. I'm always kind of curious to see what people are kind of what a typical day in, in the life of like their startup is because it's just kind of fascinating to me. So um, but sadly, Adam, we're coming to the end of the show. So let's close with mentioning where people can get more information about yourself and Lift Igniter online. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, go to Lift Igniter, um, L-I-F-T-I-G-N-I-T-E-R dot com. Um, and obviously, you can also find me at Adam Spector. Um, on LinkedIn. So. Perfect, Adam. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time of your day to be on the show and look forward to keeping in touch with you and have a good rest of your day. Yeah, no, my pleasure. Thank you. And if there's ways I can help out other aspiring entrepreneurs or obviously answer questions about machine learning, um, anyone who's listening, feel free to reach out. Happy to be helpful. Perfect, man. Well, thanks again for doing this and uh, we'll talk soon. Thanks, Kevin. Okay, bye. Thanks for listening. The music for the show is done by Electric Mantra. You can check them out at electricmantra.com and keep them in the future.